Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. This is John O'Leary. And welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast. It is an honor and a delight to have you with us as we recap season four. You know, one of the great joys of this program and my show and and our role in actively listening is to bring in exciting guests to learn more about their stories, their life, their lessons, their successes, their failures, and ultimately what it means for us. What I love about the recap, though, is that I get to summarize for those of us who are maybe just tuning in, or maybe it's been eight or nine weeks since you heard these folks share their story a little bit more about their story and a little bit about what that podcast, what that interview, what their lessons taught me. So I am delighted to spend this podcast with you unpacking the life's and the lessons from season four as we share some amazing stories and the work that they're doing, the lessons they're teaching, and again, what it means for each one of us. In preparing for today, I was trying to think of what is it about these eight guests that pulls everybody together? What's that thread? And in thinking this through, I came across a poem that I bet maybe some of you have bumped into at some point during your journey. And if not, I'd be extremely surprised. This poem was first written in 1916. The author's name is Robert, what's the last name? Robert Frost. Robert Frost. It's called The Road Not Taken. The Road Not Taken. It's uh, four stanzas long. And I think this is the poem that actually is the path taken in some regards by all eight of our guests today. So I'm going to read you this poem, and then we're going to dance through season four guest by guest with me sharing with each of you what their story was in short, but really what the main takeaway was, what it means for each of us. Here's the story, though, the poem by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down one, as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as far as the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves, no step had trod in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. My friends, in season four, we had the honor of having eight spectacular guests share their stories. What pulled each of those stories together as one is these remarkable individuals took the road less traveled upon, and it has indeed made all the difference. And I think as we get through these stories and back to your story, you will realize not only has it made a difference in their journey, as we embrace this truth in our lives and in our journeys, it will transform it going forward. So let's kick off season four recap with our first guest, and it was a big one, Les Parrott. Les is the co-creator of a small little dating site you may have heard of, eHarmony. He's the co-creator of eHarmony. He's a psychologist, a professor, a teacher, an author, husband. He's a father. He is a speaker, and he's a friend of mine. He's a great human being. When I shared the stage with Les at the Dave Ramsey Smart Conference, I was blown away by his wisdom. He shared his expertise in the past with Oprah and Barbara Walters, Tom Brokaw, among many, 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 many others. And in season four, he shared it with each and every one of us. My friends, if you felt ready to improve your relationships or if you are there right now longing for a stronger relationship, either with someone at home or even with the reflection in the mirror, 
I, I just encourage you to check out episode 35 with Les Parrott. One of the takeaways that I wrote down that I loved is the most important thing that you will do for your relationship is what you do for yourself. So frequently, we try to do these things for someone else. And that's healthy. It's wise. You got to be all in for the other. What Les was, I think, wise enough to remind us is we can't possibly be there for someone else if we aren't there first for ourselves. We, we got to make sure that we are healthy and full and then pour ourselves into those around us. As if Les was not a strong enough kickoff. We then moved from Les into my personal coach, my dear friend. It was episode 36, and her name is Edie Varley. I got to introduce you to this remarkable gal that more than 10 years ago helped me transition from real estate and construction into speaking and writing. I mean, that, that, that's a pretty radical shift. Edie Varley has an undeniable energy that absolutely captivates If you are ready to recalibrate what is truly important in your life, in your relationships, in your business, do yourself a massive favor. Check out episode 36 with my business coach, my friend, a gal that I place high, high, high on the threshold of life. Her name, Edie Varley. Listen to one of her quotes. I think she's got two that, uh, many, many, many that are stunning, but here are two that I wrote down. Busy is not productive. Your to-do list is not the most important thing. The list of commitments you actually honor is. It's not what we have out there, these things that we're pretending like we're going to get done, this long grocery list of stuff. It's the things that we actually honor through the way we show up, the lives that we live. And another one of her quotes that I love, and it's simple. You guys can write it down right now. Love is a verb. Love is a verb. I think frequently we think it's an emotion or we think it's puppy dogs and rainbows and unicorns dancing around when we get that first kiss. No, it's not. Love is a verb. It requires action. It requires intentional mindfulness. It requires us pouring ourselves and our efforts and our lives into causes, into things, into people even bigger than ourselves. Love is a verb. Thank you, Edie Varley. You great lady for the reminder. Episode 37, I practically caught fire as this man came into the studio. His name is Koran Bolden. Koran was episode 37. He was, uh, he had the ability through his smile alone to speak volumes. I wish you could see it, but I know you could hear it. It profoundly inspired me. I'm just letting people know, you know, hey, it doesn't matter what you came through, what you've gone through. You can still overcome it if you believe <laughs> and if you're uh, patient enough with yourself Man, you, to you, uh, move past your obstacles. You just shared two hours with the content in, uh, right. <laughs> in three paragraphs. So I, I got to go back a little bit. Man. He's a writer. He's an author. He's a voice in urban education and in arts. He's committed to breaking the cycle of growing up in a fatherless home. He overcame the grief of losing not only his own father, uh, the gentleman walked out on the family, but also his best friend, his older brother, to gun violence. He gave us an amazing analogy that you can pivot into your most inspired life. My friends, if you are looking for a little inspiration in your journey today, check out Quran Bolden. Do not miss it. One of his quotes, if you are patient, you'll move past most obstacles If you are simply patient, you'll move past most obstacles. And from our conversation, one of the things that I just, it it danced off off at me is the way that so many of his teachers, of his peers had completely given up on him. And yet one lady, all it takes is one, one lady saw something beautiful. She saw something remarkable in Quran. I don't think anyone else fully understood what it's like to lose a father and to lose a best friend and brother. Quran went through this. He endured this. He struggled mightily. He was giving up on life, pulling back from everything that mattered. And then the school teacher shows up and reminds him he can't do it. She believed in him. And because of that belief, he began to believe in himself. It was a beautiful reminder of the power of one alive and well in each and every one of our lives played out through the voice, through the life story of Quran Bolden. Check it out. 
in episode 37. You'll love it. And then from there, as if it's not already emotional enough, baby, Amy Brown is the co-host of the nationally syndicated Bobby Bone Show and host of Love What Matters podcast. Amy Brown is a ray of sunshine as she shares vulnerably about her life. Just use it for good. In some way, shape, or form, use this cancer for good. And I think at that point, we had already created her Twitter handle, which was Judy Be Pimp and Joy, which <laughs> I jokingly, her name was Judy, and I just typed it in because she wanted her Twitter to be Judy Chooses Joy or something like that. And for whatever reason, everything we were typing in that day that had Judy and Joy, it was they were taken. And so I literally remember being in a waiting room at MD Anderson, and I'm typing Judy B. Pimp and Joy, and it was like, available. And I was like, well, that's kind of funny, <laughs> you know? And, um, yes. you know, Pimp and meaning, um, Pimp and meaning uh, representing, um, which we've had some backlash sometimes because of the word pimp, which I totally understand. And, uh, but, but for us, it meant Judy is representing joy. And so we went with it. And then from that, the hashtag pimp and joy is really a hashtag. Um, pimp and joy was born through Bobby and me and my mom and the show and our listeners as a way to hashtag how you were choosing joy in your life or how you were choosing to spread joy to others. Yes. Her father also walked out on the family when she was a young girl she endures that loss and then more recently endures the loss of her mother to cancer. This story, as Amy shared it with us so openly and transparently, though, had much less to do with Amy, much less to do with her success, much less to do with her marriage and her life, and much more to do with the example she gleaned from her mother. Her mother as she raised her kids on her own, her mother as she faithfully went about her days, her mother, as she learned that she had cancer, and then the, how the cancer came back, and then the fight that this woman modeled as she went through the treatment, the therapies, the surgeries, the struggles, the difficulties, the weight loss, the agony of, of the cancer treatments with a grin, with a joy, with a sense of peace and a gratitude and hope, hopefulness that surpassed all the struggles that she was facing. It was contagious. The interview was contagious. Amy Brown's enthusiasm for her mother and for her life is contagious. They both are pimp and joy. And if you don't know what that means, I encourage you to check out 38 so you, that you can learn more. One of the quotes that I wrote down from that episode is this. There's always good that can come from any bad. There's always good that can come from any bad. It's a good reminder. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. Episode 39 was John O'Leary celebrating the life of one of his great heroes. I shared the story of being a nine-year-old little boy in a burn center, strapped down to a bed, unable to do a thing. I'm in the burn center. I'm in pain. I'm mad. I want to go home. And it's going to be months and months and months of heartache and struggle and therapy and torturous treatments. And then there's one glimmer. No, it's not Jack Buck. No, it's not my mom and dad. The glimmer that came in was a minimum wage employee. He was a CNA. His name is Nurse Roy. If you have not yet heard, either while I'm speaking or maybe you heard me in a seminar or maybe you read the book On Fire, the story of Nurse Roy. Uh, do me, do Nurse Roy, who is alive and well, and do yourselves a huge favor by checking out episode 39, Nurse Roy. He is going to remind you that today we're not going to talk about the power of what we can't do. We're going to talk instead about the power of what we can do and what we've got to do next to get there. Roy came into a dark place in my life and day after day, patiently, lovingly, but challengingly reminded me with this quote. Listen, boy, you are going to walk again, and I'll walk with you. Boy, you're going to walk again, and I'll walk with you. My friends, walking forward in life is very difficult if we try to do it all by ourselves, but when we have those around us, it is actually enjoyable and bearable, 
And not only is it bearable for us to be peeled out of the bed and walk forward into life, but also when we realize whether as a nurse, a teacher, an executive, a stay-at-home father or mother, a guardian, whatever our jobs in life may be, that we are inspiring those around us to walk forward and that we will walk with them. It's transformative. It's proof of the power of one. Check it out. That's episode 38, which led us into 39. I shared the story of a wonderful fella named Ben Newman. Ben Newman is not only a phenomenal presenter, a best-selling author, a successful guy in and of his own right, Uh, In full transparency, he's one of my dear friends. We became friends years and years ago at an insurance conference where I was speaking and he was working. He came up afterwards. He essentially shared that he wanted to become a friend of mine, and it has happened. He has become a friend, and I've been fortunate to now call him a friend as well. Life for Ben came at him fast, and it came at him hard. When he was six months old, his divorcee mom was diagnosed with a rare disease and given almost no chance of surviving, Uh, not only no length of time, no chance of surviving at all. Well, this woman decides that she doesn't know how many days or weeks or years she is going to be graced with. But during that time, during those days, during those weeks, During those years, she is going to love. She is going to love life and be an example to the two little boys that she was still responsible for that life is a gift, that they can overcome seemingly insurmountable hurdles, and that their mother, while she was here and long after she is gone, loves them dearly. This committed, beautiful woman kept a journal of her life. It is essentially a love letter to her boys, a love letter to life, and a love letter that each one of us learned a little bit more about when we tuned in to Ben Newman on how we can respond to adversity and how it determines the story that we are going to write. My mom kept this journal, which unleashed her positive mental attitude onto the world. She would write, beat the statistics, beat the odds, live with a disease that is chronic and fatal, believe in yourself, combat anything, purpose in life. And her perspective through that adversity, your perspective, John, that you share for all of us, I think it helps us realize that life is tough, but we have it in us to keep fighting. Life happens to each and every one of us. What matters more, though, is how we show up afterwards. Ben was an incredibly beautiful reminder of that truth. Then we stumbled into episode 41 with my friend Mark Scherenbrock. Scherenbrock is a great dude. I have looked up to this guy as a writer and as a presenter since I began my career 11 years ago. If you don't know about Mark Scherenbrock, learn more about him through episode 41. Wow, you're going to love it. I was joined by him as he shared not only some ideas on how we can grow as phenomenal leaders. He's a leadership guru and a lifelong speaker, but he also schooled us on how we can can connect more effectively with people. And listen to this. He reminded us of the importance of actually doing it. So not just kind of vaguely knowing how to do these things, but actually of doing it, of making sure that people realize that we are connected to them, that their work matters, that their lives matter, and that we appreciate them. He shared a whole lot of fascinating stories, but one that really jumped off the page at me as he was speaking, taking notes here at at studio, was the story of a a teacher that had an impact on him. He talked about a, a school teacher that when he would say, hey, how you doing, Sharon Brock? Mark would respond, hey, I'm doing okay, I'm doing good. And this guy, who was not even his teacher, would say, you're not doing good, man. You're alive. You're in Minnesota. You're healthy. You've got freedoms. You're young. You're handsome. You're athletic. You've got all the potential in the world, man. You're doing great. You're doing great, Sharon Brock. Let me ask it again. How you doing, Sharon Brock? And in time, this self-conscious kid in high school would finally realize I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It reminded me of the ability that we all have to influence those around us, to make them and to encourage them to realize that the best of their days remain in front of them. In your personal life, 
in your work, in your faith? What aspect of your life could you use that lesson of connecting more vulnerably, more effectively with those around you? Uh, If there are areas where you think there's a need, I encourage you today, check out episode 41 with Mark Scharenbrock. He's not doing good. He's doing great, man. He's doing great. So will you after you check it out. We then moved into episode 42. This one, you know, you can't play favorites in life. You can't play favorites with your uh, your children, certainly. And a podcast host can't p- play favorites with their guest. But if I could, if I could play favorites, I would tell you that episode 42 was one of my absolute favorites of all time. And from what we heard in the community. It was one of your favorites too. So if you're not familiar with this name yet, become familiar with it after this episode. Episode 42, Leah Darrow, born on a farm in Oklahoma. The first 15 years of Leah's life allowed her quiet space to hope and to dream about what life could become. When her family moved when she was 15, Leah Leah found herself scrambling to fit in and willing to bend and to conform to societal pressures to ensure that she fit in like everybody else. Uh, This ultimately would lead to her making some choices that, looking back on it, she herself is not very proud of. It eventually led to her, her finding herself in the prestigious role as being America's next top model. She became glamorous. She became successful. She was Uh, photoshopped up and celebrated in Times Square and magazine covers and around the country and around the world for her looks. In a photo studio, though, with a gentleman taking shots of her, she realized one day that what she was doing was not the right calling for her. This is that moment. (laughs) Yeah. That moment that changed changed everything for me. Um, I was in the middle of a photo shoot in in New York, and... um, I was in there and I was not feeling comfortable and I was definitely not happy with my life. My paycheck had a comma in it. <laughs> I um, I was at a place financially where I should have been extremely happy. I could buy anything I wanted at that moment, at that time in my life. And um, but I'm in this photo shoot and I've I don't I'm definitely not happy and I'm trying to obviously pretend that I am because you're you have to smile, you know, and you have to look good. So I'm trying to do that. And the photographer, we're in the middle of the shoot and. Um, he, one of the flashes, I looked directly into it and it's a rookie move. I know, but, uh, <laughs> I never do that. Okay. I just got <laughs> you guys listening. Uh, I'm in a lot of photo shoots. I never look at the flash, but anyway, rookie, go ahead. Right. Go so on. I did. And it was, um, it was in that moment. I remember turning my head and I held up my fingers so I could just regain some focus. And, and he obviously knew what I was doing. And I, uh, was just trying to trying to, you know, get my eyes back to where I could focus back in onto the shoot. And I saw this picture in my head and I saw myself standing in, in like, like a little movie was playing. I saw myself standing there and I wasn't really alarmed because I had just seen a Polaroid of myself to check the lighting. So, I mean, I just thought I was seeing what I just saw, you know, and, um, but I noticed I was wearing the outfit that I was modeling, but I had my hands cupped together at my waist. And then I raised them all the way up to like about the height of my head as if I was giving them to somebody. Um, and then I just saw out and up above me, just the profile of a man's face and, um, who I, who looked at my hands and then bowed his head as I, to me, as if he was disappointed. And then I heard five words, um, on my heart and, uh, they just said, um, I made you for more. And, and I heard those words again. And they were strong and soft, but they just kept, I just kept hearing them. I made you for more. I made you for more. And uh, obviously every time I share it, um, I get um, a little emotional because it's so personal. And it was a moment for me where I wanted to believe it more than anything in the whole world. I wanted more than anything to believe that I was made for more, that I was more than my picture, that I was more than just this model, that I was more than just this paycheck, that I was really made for more. And that that feeling I had when I was, you know, 10 years old on the farm and, and dreaming and not knowing what it was, but just believing and having the hope 
that there was something really amazing that I was called to do. That like just reignited in my Mm -hmm. heart. And I just, I began to believe that in that second. She eventually walked off the set, walked away from that career and walked into a new one where she teaches others about real beauty in life. She is a phenomenally outstanding, articulate, beautiful, passionate, wonderful lady. You are going to love her story. You're going to love her example. You're going to love what she discovered about looking in the mirror at any age, with any curves, with any wrinkles, with any blemishes, with any gray hairs, and to realize that you have enough, that you are worthy, that you are beautiful. It's a great, great episode. Check it out today. That's number 42 with Leah Darrow. Then John Brankus. Man, he's a steam train. He is one speed Johnny. He came on to set and he reminded us that our job on this planet is to perpetuate love. He's episode 43. He is ESPN's sports science guru. In college, Lonzo Ball shot a respectable 41% from the three-point line. But how will his unique jumper hold up at the next level? Find out. We brought him into the ESPN Sports Science Lab and wired him up with a state-of-the-art motion capture suit. He has won six Emmys. He wrote a New York Times bestseller. It's called The Perfection Point. Brankus realized early in college that he wanted to be in the entertainment industry. With this as his singular focus and without any connections in the field, he took a personal oath to learn the ins and the outs of producing entertainment himself. Just started simply, a little bit learning in school, a little bit of networking. He began in the basement of his parents' house. How about that for a humble beginning? He said to me, John, I had to have persistence, stubbornness, belief to stick around, even when I was just scraping by. I was just scraping by for a long time, but I had that persistence. I had that stubbornness, and I knew where this thing was going. Uh, That stubbornness and that belief paid off. He's partnered with the Discovery Channel, which led to Fox Sports, National Geographic, among others. Today, more than 10 years later, he's still doing what he loves. He's still passionate about it. And that passion for his work was so epic and so contagious, as she shared during the podcast. And then he came really alive when he talked about a flight from one city into another where he had a chance encounter with a beautiful gal that upon his very first glance into her eyes, he knew this is the one. This is the one. I wasn't expecting it when I brought John onto the podcast, but it ends up being a story not only about creativity and discovery and living out your purpose in life, but it also became a love story, not only in discovering love, but making sure that that love remains an active part of who we are and what really matters to us each day, that we never fall out of love with the things and the people closest to us. <sighs> Take a deep breath. I'm going to. Because our final guest, uh, as we wrapped up in Elite, uh, a beautiful and inspirational, a meaningful, and a very challenging season on many women who chose their own path was none other than Chris Norton. Just in time for the start of the 2017 football season, we were joined on episode 44 by brother Chris Norton. Chris was a freshman in college playing football a few years back. In his first season, he mistimed a tackle, hit the ground awkwardly and hard. He ended up paralyzed. The doctors did not think that he, one, would probably even survive the fall, if you can imagine. But secondly, if he were to survive, they never gave him a chance to walk again. Chris vulnerably shared what it's like to embrace change, to live a different version of our lives than the one we had previously thought we would be living, and how to celebrate the gift that your life is every single day, an absolute gift, an absolute gift, regardless of the challenges we face. My friends, Chris set the goal to learn to walk again, even as he laid in that hospital bed being told by doctors 
there was no chance. There was no chance. His goal was not only to get out and go home and lay on his back. No, his goal was to catch up with his class, to graduate college with them, and to walk across the stage to accept his diploma. How about that for a pretty grandiose goal as you are laying, busted, motionless, on your back, in a hospital, being told, there's no chance. There's no chance. Well, Chris proved those doctors. He proved those experts. He proved a whole lot of folks wrong. And he proved each one of us who believes that, yes, anything remains possible in life. And yes, miracles still happen in life, that those things are true, but you got to believe in them. You got to fight for them. Uh, You got to walk toward them. Uh, Season four wrapped up with episode 44. And I want to share one of the quotes because I think it's so simplistic in some regards and so overlooked that Chris shared. You've heard it before. And if you heard the episode, you heard it live from Chris. While he was in the medevac, while he's in this helicopter, while he's losing consciousness, while he's fading in and out of life and then toward death and then back again, the fight is going on. He can't speak. And he's struggling mightily just breathing. Uh, The doctors on this flight, the paramedics who are with him, kind of take their eyes off him for a while. He can't get anybody's attention because he can't speak to them, because he can't raise his voice, because it's so loud in the helicopter, and he's afraid that he's dying. And then he reminds himself two words. I think they benefited him on this life flight. They benefited him on the journey back toward walking across the stage. And, friends, they will benefit each one of us on this day and each day going forward. Two words. Here they are. Just breathe. Just breathe. Sometimes we become so concerned about tomorrow, so concerned about the next breath, the next thing, the next task, the next challenge, the next carpool line, the next meeting, the next speech, the next bill, the next whatever. Or we become so focused on all the things that went wrong yesterday, the missed tackle, the injury on the field, the broken relationship, the the, the disappointments from our past, all the things that we regret, that we forget the miracle of this moment. Just breathe. Just breathe. Sometimes it's enough to get you from point A to point B on a medevac. And I think it's more than enough to get us from point A to point B on this miraculous journey of life. Chris Norton reminded us of that truth during that final episode, episode 44. And if you did not hear the Norton interview, check it out. My friends, it was a wild, emotional, action-packed, <laughs> the, the kind of season that woke me up from accidental living. I can't tell you what a joy it was and remains to bring these types of guests, their type of energy, the lessons they've learned in their life, and what it means for each one of us in our lives into yours. We have crossed the half million plateau for downloads. That was another celebration, by the way, from season four. I mean, we we began this baby nine months ago, not really having any clue outside of bringing my own mom in, who our second guest or third guest or fourth guest might be. And as we progress forward, not only are the guests showing up, not only are they uh, showing up in mighty ways, not only are they delivering the goods and teaching us how we can live the goods in our own life, they are waking us up from accidental living. They are inspiring each and every one of us to live inspired. And the numbers who are paying attention to these examples are growing. You, my friends, are not on your own. Uh, I'm honored to be part of your family, part of your friendship, and to know that more than half a million other brothers and sisters are doing this thing with you. We're part of the Live Inspire community. If you want to learn more about these episodes, more learn more about the work that John O'Leary does, more learn, learn a little bit more about my work as a speaker, as an author, as a podcast host, as a writer, as a leader in life, I encourage you right now to check out John O'LearyInspires.com. John O'LearyInspires.com. I'll have not only this episode up there, we'll have the previous 44 episodes up there, 
Each one of them, truly, each one of them, more stunning than the next. You're going to love them all. So check those out. Share that link, by the way, with your social social community. It is a great way that we can dance forward from one. At first, it was just my mom and me. Don't forget that. And then we moved on to episode two, and then three, and then onward. And the group following and sharing has grown too. Let's keep expanding this network. Let's touch more lives. Let's together make a difference. So share these podcasts anywhere that you share your thoughts online. I appreciate you doing that. I want to remind you again, my friends, that each day of our lives, the road does indeed diverge in the yellow wood. We can follow the well-traveled path of the majority. We can complain about the things that are wrong. We can point fingers at the reasons why they are that way. We can blame shift. We can cross our arms. We can keep our hearts and minds cold possibility. That's one way to go forward. Or we can choose a road, choose a path less traveled upon. Choose the path of faithfulness, of courage, of resiliency, of love, of hope, of possibility, and grab onto the truth along the journey down that path that the best is yet to come. Looking back on season four, that is what I learned from our guests. It's what I hope you learned in tuning in with us. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to be with you in season five because the best is yet to come, my friends. So for this time and until next time, this is John O'Leary wrapping up season four, and this is your day. Live Inspired.